Now, historically, God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to bring down the hammer of his judgment against both Egypt and Judah for her long history of political alignment with and spiritual harlotry with Egypt. Look, one of the signs that will be evident that we can know that we are on the eve of the rise of the King of the North will be the widespread political, cultural, and spiritual harlotry of God's people, i.e. Christendom, with this end-time abomination called Egypt. Today we're talking about the king of the north, the one spoken of in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40 which reads, At the time of the end the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen with many ships, shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Now, if you would like a more in-depth explanation, where I go verse by verse and detail by detail, to establish what I'm about to share with you in just a couple of sentences, I would encourage you to watch my previous video called Daniel 11, The Kings of the South and North Revealed. However, for the purposes of this video, the very short version of that presentation is as follows. The terms the King of the South and the King of the North, they first appear in the beginning of Daniel chapter 11, in reference to the division of Alexander the Great's kingdom. Now, because we're interpreting Daniel 11 and verse 40 typologically, what that means is we are going to take what we learn from the division of Alexander's kingdom at the beginning of the chapter and use it as a historical type from which to interpret the identities of the kings of the south and north at the time of the end. Okay, so with that being said, I would argue that the king of the south at the time of the end is typological Egypt. Why? Because Ptolemy, who was the original king of the south, introduced in verse 5, he ruled over Egypt. In contrast to Ptolemy, the first king of the north is Seleucus Nicator. Now, while the Seleucid Empire is today more commonly thought of as being associated with Antioch, which is in the modern territory of Syria, this was in fact the last of three cities that all served at one time as the capital of the Seleucid Empire. History records that Seleucus actually began his reign and established the start of his empire while ruling in the ancient city of Babylon. So between the two of them, Ptolemy and Seleucus, what we have is Egypt versus Babylon. Now, with regards to the king of the south being Egypt, whether we're talking about historically or typologically at the time of the end, this is fairly easy to demonstrate within the boundaries of Daniel 11 itself. Regarding the historical actions of the king of the south, it says in verse 8, And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt, with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Now. Why does the king of the south carry these captured icons and treasures back to Egypt? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's because Egypt is where he is from. The king of the south, i.e. the Ptolemaic Empire, ruled in Egypt. Now, with regards to the time of the end, it states very definitively in verse 42 that the target of the king of the north's whirlwind counterattack is in fact Egypt as well. It reads, he, speaking of the king of the north, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So what we see here is that verse 42 clearly identifies the end time king of the south as Egypt. Now keep in mind here, we're not talking about the literal modern nation state called Egypt today. Rather, what we're talking about is a global ruling cultural, political, and monetary system that the Bible likens typologically to ancient Egypt. Now, historically speaking, the kingdom that defeated ancient Egypt was Babylon. 
Therefore, I would argue that it is a fairly logical leap to assume that the in-time destroyer of typological Egypt, i.e. the king of the north and his whirlwind counterattack, would likewise be the king of an in-time typological Babylon. Now, before I read verse 43, which again refers to the king of the south as Egypt, I want to read to you two passages about Egypt and Babylon from the prophet Ezekiel. What we're going to find is that Daniel's prophecy about end time events mirrors the reality of what happened historically between Egypt and Babylon. This is, of course, what we call typology. In Ezekiel chapter 26, we read, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the, where? That's right, from the north. And what king is it that comes from the north? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. King of kings with horses, with chariots and horsemen, and an army with many people. So in this verse, Nebuchadnezzar is said to come, one, from the north, And two, it is said that he would come militarily against Tyre. Now, jumping ahead to chapter 29, we read this. And it came to pass in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his armies to labor strenuously against Tyre. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder rubbed raw. Yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre for the labor which they expended on it. Now Nebuchadnezzar's siege against Tyre began after the destruction of Jerusalem, and it lasted for 13 years. However, his campaign against Tyre ultimately ended without the decisive victory sought, which also means that it ended without the customary spoils of war. That is what God is referring to here when he tells Ezekiel that Nebuchadnezzar had not received his wages from Tyre. Now verse 19, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now notice this, He shall take away her wealth. That's the wealth of Egypt. Carry off her spoils and remove her pillage and that will be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor because they worked for me, says the Lord God. Now, if you go back and read the entire chapter, it is fairly obvious that the theme of Ezekiel chapter 29 is God's pronounced judgments of destruction against Egypt. Now, it just so happened to be, historically speaking, that it was Nebuchadnezzar who executed God's judgments against Egypt, and in so doing, it clearly states that the wealth of Egypt was transferred to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, notice how the same theme appears with regards to the destruction of Egypt, i.e. the king of the south, at the time of the end. Starting in verse 42, we read, He, again, this is the king of the north, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries in the land of Egypt, shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. So when the king of the north comes against the king of the south like a whirlwind, Just as it was in the case of the historical nations, Egypt and Babylon, the wealth of Egypt, i.e. its treasures of gold and silver, will be given over to the king of the north, who I would argue is the king of the end-time typological Babylon. Now, when it comes to the rise and division of Alexander the Great's kingdom, which is where we find the original use of the terms the king of the south and the king of the north, for us, this is all ancient history. And because of this, it might be easy for us to overlook the typological connection that existed between Ptolemy, Seleucus, and the historical figures that not only preceded them, but also typified them. 
However, from Daniel's perspective, the coming of the Macedonian Greek Empire was a future prophecy, one that was in fact far beyond the days of his own life. Now, even though the angel was narrating to Daniel prophecies about events that would take place long after his own death, he used language to describe these future events that would have been familiar to Daniel's own experience. Let me explain. You see, Daniel was taken from Judah when he was only a youth and he lived the majority of his life serving in the royal courts of Babylon, which is to say that Daniel lived during the time when Egypt and Babylon were the two ruling superpowers of the world. The destruction of Egypt by Nebuchadnezzar, spoken of by Ezekiel, that we just read about, this would have been for Daniel the front page news of his day. Now, given Judah's geographical location of being stuck right in the middle between Egypt and Babylon, from Daniel's perspective, and quite frankly, from the perspective of anyone living in Judah at the time leading up to or during the period of the Babylonian captivity, it would have been common knowledge that the king of the north was a reference to Babylon. How do we know this? Well, We know this because of the way that the prophet Jeremiah referred to the destruction that he prophesied would come upon Jerusalem. Jeremiah repeatedly warned that God's judgments would come upon them from the north. He wrote, Jeremiah 1.14, Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north, calmity shall break forth on the inhabitants of the land. Chapter 4, verse 6, set up a standard towards Zion, take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Jeremiah 6, 1, for disaster appears out of the north. Chapter 10, verse 22, behold, the noise of the report has come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate. Now, when this prophesied desolation and destruction did finally come, it came from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jeremiah 34, 2, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city, that's Jerusalem, into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, remember that phrase, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolations. Look, when Daniel heard the angel refer to the coming of the future Greek empire, as the king of the south and the king of the north, he would have immediately recognized the language and been able to understand that there would be a typological connection between the Egypt and Babylon of his day and the forthcoming Greek empire in the future. In other words, not only did Ptolemy and Seleucus have geographical ties to Egypt and Babylon, based on where they physically established their respective kingdoms, in the text itself, by referring to them as the king of the south and the king of the north, they likewise had inherent in their prophetic identity typological ties to Egypt and Babylon. Now, I believe that these same inherent typological ties also exist between Egypt and Babylon and the end-time kings of the south and north that will represent a bifurcated civilization that will clash with each other at the time of the end. 
Now, one of the ways that we have to self-check, I guess you could say, our own interpretations of Daniel is to cross-reference them with the book of Revelation. And when we do that, what we will find is that the Apostle John also writes about two globalist beast systems, one in which he likened to Egypt and the other he called Babylon. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, it reads, When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called. Now that phrase, which spiritually is called, this means that John wants us to interpret what comes next, either symbolically or typologically, and not through the lens of modern nation-state literalism. He says, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. So in other words, this beast is typological Egypt, just as is the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11. Now, I would go as far as to say that given their shared connection to Egypt, they are in fact describing the same global empire. Now, if you would like to do a deep dive, as in watch an hour and a half detailed breakdown of exactly who the King of the South is at the time of the end, I would encourage you to watch my previous video called The King of the South, Prequel to Antichrist. However, for the remainder of this video, we're going to focus solely on the King of the North. So with the beast from the bottomless pit, we've demonstrated that Egypt exists in the prophetic narrative of Revelation. But what about Babylon? Well, with regards to Babylon, the word itself appears six times in the book of Revelation. The first is found in chapter 14, which states, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, the first thing that stands out from this verse is that we do in fact see Babylon in the book of Revelation. However, the tricky part about linking the king of the north from Daniel 11 to Babylon in Revelation is that we have to first distinguish which part of Revelation's Babylon the king of the north is associated with. So, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at our next verse. In chapter 16, it says, that when the great city called Babylon does fall, it will be divided into three parts. We read in verse 19. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, let's take a moment and reverse engineer this. The reason that Babylon is said to be divided into three parts when it falls is because the very thing that John calls Babylon exists because of the unity of its three parts. Now, of course, the logical next question would be, well, what are the three parts? The answer to that is found earlier in the chapter, specifically in verse 13, which reads, And I saw three Unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that's one, out of the mouth of the beast, that's two, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, that's three. Now, these three appear also, and for the first time together, in Revelation chapter 13. We read, Then I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast, that's one, rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, that's two, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So here we have two out of the three, which are the dragon and the beast, but what about the false prophet? 
Well, he is described in chapter 13 as another beast that in contrast to the first beast, which came up out of the sea, the second beast comes up out of the earth. Verse 11 reads, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So out of the three parts of Babylon, which one is the same as the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40? Well, I would argue that it is the same as the second beast from Revelation chapter 13, the one that comes up out of the earth and is later described as the false prophet. Now, how exactly do we know that the king of the north is the same as the beast from the earth? Well, first of all, we know that he is not the dragon because Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 tells us that the dragon is Satan. Therefore, that leaves us as an option one of the other two beasts. Now, the first beast that comes up out of the sea, this is associated with the little horn of Daniel 7 and is commonly understood to be the Antichrist. The reason we associate this beast with Daniel 7 is because it is described as a composite of the same beast that we find in the vision of Daniel 7. Now, this beast is also commonly understood to be the same as the woman described as a harlot in Revelation chapter 17. Now, this isn't to suggest that the Antichrist is in reality going to be a woman. However, it is still a fact that in the symbolic language of Revelation, one of the three parts of Babylon is described as a harlot who has written on her forehead the name Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Now, we don't have time in this video to break down the symbolism of a woman in Bible prophecy, so that will have to wait for another time. However, what we can say in short is that a woman cannot be the king of Babylon, i.e. the king, a male figure, of the north. She can be the queen of Babylon, but not its king. Now, again, in reality, these two beasts are going to be fulfilled by two men. However, in the symbolic language of Revelation, we do have a Mrs. Babylon and we have a Mr. Babylon. The king of the north from Daniel 11 is going to be the same as Mr. Babylon. Now, that leads us back to the beast that comes up out of the earth, which is significant because the earth or the ground itself is a typological symbol of man. It was from the ground, i.e. the earth, that Adam was formed, and it was the ground from which he was formed that was cursed for his sake after he sinned. Now, the fact that this end-time global beast system here in Revelation is called Babylon, this, I believe, undeniably links this end-time system typologically to the ancient kingdom of Babylon. Now, I also believe that because of the image from Nebuchadnezzar's dream found in Daniel chapter 2, there is a hard line of connectivity between Nebuchadnezzar, the original king of the north, and all other emperors or kings of the north that throughout history have fulfilled the prophecies of this prophetic image. We might go as far as to say that the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a composite image of all the various kings of the north throughout history. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's first take a look at Daniel's description of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He said, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly of thighs, of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream was the image of a man. Again, there is a Mrs. Babylon and there is a Mr. Babylon. This image is describing the male side of that equation. Now in the interpretation of the image, Daniel says this to Nebuchadnezzar. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, 
power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar himself, Daniel says directly to him, you are this head of gold. Now he goes on to inform the king that the silver, the bronze, and the iron, and the rest of the image represented three other kingdoms that would arise after Babylon. We know that these were Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, here's the point that I want to make and why I bring this image up as part of this discussion. The image in Daniel chapter 2, this is the first eschatological prophecy of its kind found in the Bible. It maps out the history of mankind from Nebuchadnezzar right down to the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. In essence, this image stands as an outline for all biblical eschatology. And when it comes to the kingdoms depicted in this image, i.e. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, along with Rome's extension, i.e. the feet of iron and clay, because they are all depicted as a single connected image, I believe there is a line of typological connectivity that runs throughout all of the kings and emperors that ruled in each of these successive empires. In other words, if we want to interpret the identity of the king of the north at the time of the end through the typological method, as opposed to, say, pure personal speculation, then this image provides us with a map, if you will, of where we can find all the relevant kings, kingdoms, and major transitional events that will give us the typological basis to formulate a biblical understanding of who the king of the north at the time of the end will be. Look, Solomon, the wisest man in the Bible, wrote in Ecclesiastes, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has been in ancient times before us. In essence, Solomon lays out here one of the best arguments ever for why typology should be at the center of not only our soteriology, but also our eschatology. What we are experiencing today and what we will experience in the future is indebitably linked to the past. However, even if we accept this premise that we are to interpret the present and predict the future only by first understanding the patterns of the past, we still need to know how to properly determine which historical events rise to the level of having typological relevance and the authoritative weight to interpret present and or future in time events from other historical events that do not hold such typological relevance. Well, I would argue that this is where the image of Daniel 2 comes into play. I believe that we should consider every person and or every major transitional event that is depicted in this image and previously a fulfillment of this prophecy as a potential historical type that can help us shape our understanding of who our in-time King of the North will be. Now, to illustrate what I'm talking about here, let's consider the names from history that appear in relation to this image. We'll start at the top with Nebuchadnezzar. As we read previously, Daniel told him, You are this head of gold. Now look, I have a whole chapter in my book dedicated to just the typology of Nebuchadnezzar, and we could go on here for hours doing just a Nebuchadnezzar deep dive. However, I just want to point out a couple of highlights with regards to Nebuchadnezzar, and then we can move on to our other examples. In Ezekiel chapter 30, it says, Thus says the Lord God, I will also make a multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Then in verse 25, God adds, Thus I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. They shall know that I am the Lord when 
I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt. Now, in a previous verse that we read from Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 9, God called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. And now here in Ezekiel chapter 30, God says that they will know that I am the Lord when my sword, that's God's sword, is in Nebuchadnezzar's hand and he stretches it out against Egypt. Now, the question is this. How do we square this apparent cozy relationship between God and Nebuchadnezzar with the absolute pride and arrogance of Nebuchadnezzar that we read about in Daniel chapter 4? Can somebody who is full of arrogance and pride be used by God? Or what about the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up and forces everyone to worship in Daniel chapter 3? Which is, by the way, another reason that we know that the king of the north is associated with the beast that comes up out of the earth, because both of them set up images and force others to worship these images at the pain of death. Well, the answer to this conundrum is found in the description of the beast from the earth. It says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. So what this verse is telling us is that the king of the north will possess the qualities of both the lamb and the dragon, which of course represents both Christ and Satan. So how can that be? Well, one possibility is that the king of the north is more likely a title rather than a single man meaning the first to fulfill the role might be more lamb-like in his actions, while the next to reign after him will tend to speak more like a dragon. However, even if we're talking about a conflicting duality within a single man, what we should expect out of him is actions that fulfill both the plans of God and the plans of Satan. Now, with regards to the actions carried out by the earth beast in Revelation chapter 13, i.e., mandating image worship and the mark of the beast, I would argue that those actions are clearly the plans of Satan. However, with regards to the king of the north decimation of Egypt, the king of the south in Daniel 11, 40-43, I would argue that these actions are the carrying out of the plans of God. Just as it was God's will for Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Egypt historically, I believe that the king of the north at the time of the inn will likewise be carrying out God's will when he comes against Egypt like a whirlwind. Now again, I would refer you to my previous video, The King of the South, prequel to Antichrist, for the supporting arguments for what I'm about to share with you. However, for those who have already watched that video, here are some of the current forces in the world today that I would argue fall under the umbrella of typological Egypt, or we could say more broadly speaking, the King of the South political system, which is currently ruling the world today. Now remember, for those of you who watched the previous video, we learned that the King of the South is a composite of the typological Sons of Ham. Okay, so referring back to our diagram from the last video, we have here on the top, the central bank, i.e. the Federal Reserve, which is our modern-day pharaoh and typological Egypt. Now, when we talk about the central bank, we cannot fail to mention the military-industrial complex. Why? Because since World War II, it, or what's commonly called the American Empire, has ensured that the dollar has remained the world's reserve currency, which is the cornerstone or the foundation of the King of the South's imperial power in the world today. Now keep this in mind, the King of the South is the same as the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11. Now remember, in Bible prophecy, a beast is always describing a world-ruling empire. It is never talking about some small country with only regional influence. It has to be talking about the ruling, 
power structure of the world today, which is the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Now, with regards to our other two sons of Ham, off to the right here, we have globalism and more specifically the globalist corporations, which fulfill the typology of Cush and the Tower of Babel. And then let's not forget, off to the left, we have the LGBTQ cultural revolution, which of course fulfills the typology of Sodom. Now think about this. Has it ever occurred to you that it seems like the only two things the West either stands for or attempts to export to the rest of the world are either dollars or the rainbow ideology? This is not an accident, folks. If you remember the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11, it is described as both Sodom and Egypt. Now, in addition to our typological sons of Ham, we have a whole host of supporting caste, such as the Deep State, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the European Union, the IMF, the European Central Banks. Then we have the media in all forms of propaganda and narrative control. We also have ideologies like communism, Marxism, the Green New Deal, communism repackaged as environmentalism, which simply just means depopulation for the sake of the planet. Oh, how benevolent. Now, of course, all of these institutions and ideologies have their philosophical roots in humanism, the Enlightenment, evolution, and oh, let's not forget the cult of trust the science. Now, of course, this list is neither exhaustive nor explanatory in and of itself. However, it paints a fairly clear picture of which side of the anti-Christian political and cultural spectrum that the King of the South empire is on. Now, given the historical fact that God used the King of Babylon to destroy ancient Egypt, and that all the things on the list just mentioned fall under the banner of typological Egypt, I would argue that whoever the king of the north is at the time of the end, he will, one, be on the opposite side of the political spectrum from the powers that I just mentioned, and two, when he comes to power and is provoked to do so by being attacked from the king of the south, he will come against Egypt like a whirlwind and will destroy and decimate the aforementioned powers. However, according to Daniel 11.43, which reads, He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. We need to understand that the monetary system, which the Federal Reserve currently controls and which is the source of modern-day Egypt's power, this will not necessarily be destroyed, but will rather be taken over. Plainly speaking, the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, this is what gives the King of the South's power in the world. When the King of the North comes, he will take over the levers of power that are held when one controls the monetary system. This is what will give the King of the North the ability to enforce the mark of the beast. Now, it says in Revelation chapter 14, before the declared fall of Babylon, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now, historically, God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to bring down the hammer of his judgment against both Egypt and Judah for her long history of political alignment with and spiritual harlotry with Egypt. We must remember that Peter said, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Look, one of the signs that will be evident that we can know that we are on the eve of the rise of the King of the North will be the widespread political, cultural, and spiritual harlotry of God's people, i.e. Christendom, 
with this end-time abomination called Egypt. If this was true in the historical type, it will be true at the end as well. It just so happens it was true in the historical type. In 2 Kings chapter 23, it speaks about how Pharaoh Necho placed Jehoiakim on the throne of Judah to serve as a vassal king of Egypt. It goes on to describe how he used excessive taxation of the people of Judah as the way to pay tribute to Pharaoh. It reads, So Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his assessment, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Now most people don't understand this, but the reason that the 16th Amendment that legalized an income tax here in America was passed in 1913 the same year as the Federal Reserve Act, is because an income tax and central banking always go hand in hand. Just as Jehoiakim taxed the people of Judah to pay tribute to Pharaoh, so does our government today tax our income to pay tribute to the central bank, i.e. our modern-day Pharaoh. You see, the Fed prints money out of thin air and either loans it directly or gives it to commercial banks to loan to the U.S. government. It's called quantitative easing. And in return for the loans, the government imposes an unjust and excessive income tax on its own citizens to pay as tribute the interest on the loans that the central bank gave to the government with, of course, money that they just simply printed out of thin air. The fact that we live under this system today is evidence that we, in fact, do live under the rule of Egypt, the king of the south. Now, in addition to the taxation, in rabbinical writings, it says that Jehoiakim was so pro-Egypt that he only wore Egyptian clothes and that he went so far as to have a surgical procedure done so as to undo his circumcision. Now, I can't imagine what that would be, but Sounds pretty fanatical if you ask me. Now, as I said earlier, God brought judgment against Jerusalem for her prolonged political and spiritual harlotry with Egypt. However, we must point out that Jehoiakim was the king of Judah at the time when God brought these judgments against them by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, while it would not be correct to say that Jehoiakim was single-handedly responsible for all the evil and abominations that finally triggered God's judgments to come upon Jerusalem, it would, however, be proper to question whether his extreme pro-Egyptian orientation at the time might possibly serve as a typological indication of what the condition of Christendom will be at the time of the end when the king of the north comes to power. Now, regardless of what you or I might think about the legitimacy of the papacy, with nearly 1.4 billion Roman Catholics in the world, it cannot be denied that the Pope is the most powerful and influential man in all of Christendom today, just as was Jehoiakim in Judah at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's rise. Now, given the list of things that I mentioned earlier that I believe fall under the banner of end-time typological Egypt, what does this say about our place in the prophetic timeline that Comrade Bergoglio, i.e. Pope Francis, who supports most of the items on the list, is the most pro-Egyptian, pro-socialist, pro-Green New Deal, and pro-LGBTQ Pope that the Catholic Church has ever seen. Could his papacy and the abominations of Egypt that he supports be a sign that the king of the north is near or even already here? Well, for certain we do not know. But given the striking parallels between the two, it's at least worth asking the question. Now, the next individual that we have connected to our image here is Cyrus. He, of course, was famously called out by name by God through the prophet Isaiah, 
some 200 years before his birth. It reads in Isaiah 45 verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Now, the last part here about the double doors and the gates not being shut, this is a reference to how Babylon actually fell. Cyrus had his soldiers dig ditches to divert the waters of the Euphrates River. He did this so that the water levels would subside and he could march his armies under the walls and into the city. Now, when he got into the city, likely because of the drunken feast that Belshazzar was throwing, you can read about that in Daniel chapter 5, the gates of the city were carelessly left open, granting him and his army access into the city. That very night, Babylon fell. Therefore, Cyrus is unmistakably linked to the fall of Babylon. Now, in Daniel 11, after the king of the north defeats Egypt, it says in verse 44, But news from the east and the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. I believe that this verse is a reference to the fall of end-time Babylon. Now, the empire that succeeded Babylon historically was comprised of two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians. The Medes were to the north of Babylon, and the Persians were to the east of them. Therefore, I would argue that the news from the east and from the north that troubles the end-time king of Babylon, this would be in reference to his eminent fall. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the word Babylon appears six times in the book of Revelation. In each instance that it does, the context is the fall of Babylon. Now, given Cyrus's role in the fall of ancient Babylon, it should not be hard to see that he would likewise be linked typologically to the fall of Revelations in time Babylon. We read in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. The drying up of the river Euphrates here is not a reference to a literal river drying up somewhere in the Middle East. Rather, this is a typological reference to how ancient Babylon fell, which, as we just noted, was brought about by Cyrus diverting, i.e. drying up, the waters of the Euphrates River. Now, many biblical scholars have recognized Cyrus as a type of Christ. Here is one example of where I would agree with this. It says here in Revelation 16.12 that the river Euphrates would be dried up to make way for the kings from the east. So who are these kings from the east? Well, Jesus said, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Therefore, I would argue that the kings, plural, from the east, is God himself, i.e. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who at the second coming of Christ will be responsible for the fall of revelations in time Babylon. Now moving on with our image here, the next person up is Alexander the Great. We can read about him here in Daniel 11 in verse 3. It says, Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion, do according to his will, and when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. So it says here that Alexander's kingdom would be divided into four. This would be amongst his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Now, as soon as you move on into verse 5, in Daniel chapter 11, it only ever after refers to two divisions of the kingdom, i.e. the king of the south and the king of the north. So the question here is, how do we go from four down to just two? Well, here's what happened. Cassander ruled in Greece. Lysimachus ruled in Thrace. 
Lysimachus defeated Cassander and annexed his territory into his own. Then Seleucus defeated Lysimachus and annexed both of their territories into his own kingdom. Thus the Seleucid Empire, i.e. the King of the North, came to be comprised of three parts of the division of Alexander the Great's kingdom. Now, where does this sound familiar? Well, it should sound familiar to Revelations of Babylon, which we demonstrated earlier, is comprised of three parts, i.e. the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, when it comes to this King of the South slash King of the North motif that we find first introduced here in Daniel 11, We need to understand that this is an intra-civilizational conflict. It's not describing Greeks fighting Persians or Greeks fighting the Chinese or whatever. No, rather it's Greeks fighting Greeks. Now when we get down to the time of the end, I believe that this will likewise be true of the clash that we see described between the king of the south and the king of the north in verse 40 through 43. In other words, this will be a bifurcation of and a civil war for control of a single civilization. A civilization, by the way, that would be the ruling civilization of the world at the time of the end. Think about it. When the king of the south and the king of the north are introduced, Greece is the ruling civilization of the world. Therefore, it only makes sense that the final kings of the south and north at the time of the end will likewise represent the bifurcation of the ruling civilization of the world. I also believe, and going back here to the image from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that the final ruling civilization that we're talking about is going to be the natural continuation of, as in the civilizational heirs, of the Greco-Roman bronze thigh slash iron legs. To state it plainly, the civilization that we're talking about here is the West, i.e. Western civilization that, one, is the ruling civilization of the world today and has been for some 500 plus years, and two, the West legitimately has its cultural, philosophical, religious, and political identity rooted in its historical ties to and continuity with its Greco-Roman origins. When it comes to the feet of iron and clay here in Nebuchadnezzar's image, we're talking about a civilization that has an unbroken continuity with the Roman Empire. That's why iron is in the feet. It's not Islam. It's not Israel. It's not China. No, it's Western Christendom that is turned into secular humanist Western civilization. Look, the intra-civilizational conflict that takes place at the time of the end is going to be between what remains of Western Christendom and the secular humanist and evil forces that have all but de-Christianized the West. Which means when he comes, the king of the north will be, as the saying goes, the leader of the free world. Now, under Alexander the Great, we have the line that includes the various kings of the north, starting with Seleucus and Nicator, and then, of course, we have everyone's favorite, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. Now, many people believe that Antiochus IV is a type of the Antichrist. However, the problem with this view is that it confuses the king of the north's line of succession with that of the Antichrist, i.e. the little horn of Daniel 7 and the beast that comes up out of the sea, in Revelation chapter 13. Now, one of the most obvious things that gets overlooked when it comes to the Antichrist is that there are two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. Not just one, but two. Which means that the Antichrist does not exist or rule alone at the time of the end. Rather, there is a union between the two beasts. Just read Revelation chapter 13. It is beyond obvious that there is in fact a union of purpose and the exercise of power between the two beasts. Look, Antiochus IV is clearly in the king of the north's line of succession, which would mean and necessitate, I would argue, that any typological value that he has would need to be assigned to the king of the north, not to the Antichrist, which means 
to the beast that comes up out of the earth, not the other one, the beast that comes up out of the sea, which is commonly understood to be the Antichrist. So what common theme do we see with Antiochus IV and other historical kings of the north? Well, the first king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar, he burned Jerusalem to the ground and utterly destroyed Solomon's temple. In contrast, Antiochus' desecration of the temple, i.e. his sacrificing a pig in the courtyard, it was bad, as it was in fact an abomination. But it was also, and obviously so, far more mild than actually destroying the temple. Not to mention, as I would argue, it was not even as bad as what Pompey did himself to desecrate the temple. After some time, the Roman Republic, under General Pompey, defeated the Seleucid Empire, thus effectively becoming the new king of the north. Now, upon his arrival in Jerusalem, Pompey actually went into the temple, marched right in behind the veil and into the most holy place. Now, lucky for him, the Ark of the Covenant was not there, or he would have likely died on the spot. Of course, the typological thread, if you will, comes full circle in AD 70 when Titus, the son of Emperor Vespasian, and later Emperor himself, did to Jerusalem and to the temple what his typological forefather Nebuchadnezzar had done, which is to say that he leveled Jerusalem and the temple to the ground, just as Jesus had predicted, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So does all this mean that there's going to be a third temple built in Jerusalem so that the King of the North and the Antichrist can come together again and walk into the courtyard and offer pigs or go into the most holy place or even destroy it again? No. Look, folks, this is one of the most ridiculous and hyper literalist interpretations that has ever existed. Standing in the shadow of the Second Temple, Jesus referred to his own body as the temple. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, oh, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Look, when you interpret the word temple in the New Testament to be a reference to a literal third temple being built in Jerusalem, now think about this. You're interpreting the use of the word temple in the exact same literalist manner that the Pharisees did when they heard Jesus speak of his own body as the temple. And just so we're clear here, this is not a compliment. Interpreting scripture in the same hyper-literalist way that the Pharisees did is not something to be proud of. Look, folks, as the followers of Jesus, i.e. the church, We are the body of Christ here on earth, and if Christ's body is the temple of the new covenant, then that means the church is the temple on earth in the new covenant. Under the old covenant, the abomination of desolation was when the king of the north entered into the temple and either desecrated it, as did Antiochus IV and Pompey, or destroyed it outright, as did Nebuchadnezzar and Titus. However, under the new covenant, the abomination of desolation is when the king of the north seeks to either destroy the church outright through persecution or desecrate it through subjugation and heresy. Now, this brings us to the next individual who represents a major transitional event here on our image from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Of course, we're talking about none other than Octavian, or as some may know him, Caesar Augustus, Rome's first emperor. We read in the Gospel of Luke the following about the birth of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. 
And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, for one, this passage tells us clearly that Jesus, the Messiah, was born under the reign of Caesar Augustus, Rome's first emperor. Now, I also believe that it parallels the following passage about the king of the north from Daniel chapter 11 and verse 20, which reads, There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, like the ones that caused Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. Now Augustus did not die in battle, nor did he die by assassination, like his adoptive father Julius Caesar had. But rather he died by natural causes on August 19th, AD 14, the age of 75. Now considering that the Messiah's first advent took place under the reign of Rome's first emperor, In retrospect, I would argue that Octavian's rise to power as Rome's first emperor could have been understood at the time to be a sign of the Messiah's coming. Likewise, I would also argue that when we see the ruling republic of the world at the time of the end transition from a republic to being ruled by an emperor, i.e. the king of the north, we too should understand that the coming of Messiah's second advent is very near. Now, for this reason, I believe that it is prudent for us to take another typologically curious look at the history of Rome's transition from a republic to that of an empire. Now, with that in mind, the Seleucid Empire, i.e. the King of the North, came to an end in 63 BC when after being defeated by Pompey, it was annexed into the Roman Republic. At this point, the Roman Republic effectively became the new king of the north. However, this did not represent the major transitional event depicted here in the image from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Why? Because every transition in this image from one metal and body part to another represented the end of the prior kingdom and the start of the undisputed reign of the new empire. Even though the Seleucid Empire had come under control of the Roman Republic, the Macedonian Greek Empire established by Alexander the Great had not yet come to an end. This is because Egypt, i.e. the king of the south, under Greek Ptolemaic rule, was still an independent kingdom at this time. In 60 BC, Pompey joined Julius Caesar and Marcus Crassus to form the first triumvirate, which was supposed to see the Roman Republic ruled by three equal political leaders. However, this arrangement eventually devolved into a civil war between Caesar and Pompey. The Senate sided with Pompey. However, after being defeated in battle by Caesar in 48 BC, Pompey fled to Egypt in hopes of finding support. Instead, he was greeted at the shore and was killed by order of the very young King Ptolemy XIII. Caesar arrived shortly after and was presented with the severed head of Pompey. It is said that he was saddened over the death of his former rival. As history records, Caesar did not leave Egypt as quickly as the Greeks would have liked him to. Rather, he stayed in having been exposed to the sibling rivalry taking place between Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra VII, he inserted himself as mediator to resolve the dispute over who should rule in Egypt. This resolution, of course, came in favor of Cleopatra. Perhaps his affair with Cleopatra gave her the advantage she needed, or perhaps Ptolemy had already turned Caesar against him when he incorrectly assumed it was a good idea to kill a decorated Roman general and statesman. Now, of course, Julius Caesar did eventually leave Egypt, and he did return to Rome, where on March 15, 44 BC, the Roman senators stabbed him to death on the Senate floor. They believed the assassination of Julius Caesar was necessary to stop what they saw as the slipping away of senatorial power to a would-be tyrant. They had also hoped that restoring power to the Senate would revive the old Roman spirit 
and the enthusiasm of the people for the republic. However, things quickly spiraled out of control and they were forced to leave the city. Out of the chaos created from Caesar's assassination, there arose in 43 BC a second triumvirate, consisting of a political alliance between Mark Antony, Marcus Lepidius, and lastly Octavian, the great nephew and adopted son of Julius Caesar. They vowed to avenge Caesar's death and to restore order to the Republic. However, with regards to the latter, their political alliance would in reality go the way of the first triumvirate. In 36 BC, Lepidius was sidelined and the alliance between Octavian and Antony turned into open civil war. One issue that fueled Octavian's dislike of Antony was the fact that he had turned his affections and his attention away from Octavia, Antony's wife and Octavian's sister, in favor of his adulterous love affair with Cleopatra. He would also use this love affair to convince the Senate to declare war on Cleopatra. Two years earlier, in 34 BC, Antony had brought his loyalty to Rome and to be in Roman into question when he and Cleopatra held an extravagant triumphal ceremony in Alexandria to celebrate the annexation of Armenia. To say the least, a ceremony resembling a Roman triumph, but taking place in a foreign land rather than in Rome, did not sit well with the Roman Senate or the Roman populace. Octavian did not forego the opportunity to use this event to soil Antony's public image even further than his own actions did themselves. This propaganda campaign to paint Anthony as un-Roman was necessary because already being weary from years of previous war, the Senate was reluctant to declare yet another civil war against a Roman. Octavian would put the nail in the coffin of Anthony's public image when he seized the opportunity to obtain Anthony's will and read it aloud to the entire Senate. In his will, Anthony listed his children with Cleopatra as his heirs. He also directed that if he should die in Rome, his body was to be sent to Cleopatra so he could be buried in Alexandria, Egypt. This specific provision revived rumors that Anthony wanted to move the capital from Rome to Alexandria. These improprieties on the part of Anthony along with Octavian's suggestion to declare war on Cleopatra and not on Antony directly, gave the Senate both the motivation and enough political distance from civil war that in 32 BC the Senate declared war against Cleopatra and Ptolemaic Egypt, i.e. the king of the south, giving Octavian exactly what he wanted, victory in an unobstructed pathway to becoming Rome's first emperor. Long story short, Rome won. In 30 BC, Anthony and Cleopatra committed suicide, bringing an end to the war. In the same year, Rome annexed Egypt and the Greek Empire officially gave way to Rome. The major transitional event depicted in the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream was now fulfilled. From this point forward, Octavian was the sole and undisputed ruler in Rome until his death. Most historians mark the beginning of his official reign as emperor in the year 27 BC. Now, here's what we need to understand from all of this. The series of events that brought an end to the Macedonian Greek Empire, thus fulfilling the image's transitional prophecy from the bronze thighs to the iron legs, these were the exact same series of events that likewise brought an end to the Roman Republic and saw the rise of the Roman Empire. That means, and think about this, if Octavian's rise to power was a sign of the Messiah's first advent, and his rise to power was accomplished by defeating Ptolemaic Egypt, i.e. the king of the south, in battle, then the sign of the Messiah's first advent was a battle between the king of the south and the king of the north. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because in Daniel 11.40 and onward into chapter 12, it is the battle between the king of the south and the king of the north that is a sign that we've entered into the final period of earth's history called the time of the end, which means it will be the very sign of the nearness of the Messiah's second advent. What happened in history prefigures what will happen 
in the final days. Now, get this. Some 500 years before, in 509 BC, the Roman Republic was born. Now, notice that I said republic, as in a republican form of government. In contrast, sometime shortly after, in 508-507 BC, democracy was born in Athens, Greece. In other words, the Romans were the republicans and the Greeks were the democrats. And while the Romans were fighting the Greeks under the pretension of saving the republic, i.e. make Rome great again, what actually happened in reality is it brought about the transition from being a republic into being ruled by an emperor. Now notice I didn't say a tyrant or a dictator. Why? Because given the peace and prosperity that Rome enjoyed under Octavian, i.e. the Pax Romana as it's known, the Romans at the time viewed his reign very favorably. Were there tyrants and despots who ruled Rome after him? Yes, absolutely. But this was not how history speaks of the reign of Octavian. And it is not how the people, at the time of the end, will view, initially at least, the rise of the king of the north. His decimation of Egypt will be viewed by many as a welcome deliverance from the insane and evil people who are currently attempting to destroy our civilization and our way of life. Now, when it comes to comparing America to the Roman Empire, there is absolutely no shortage of commentary on the subject. Now, while some may scoff at this as nothing more than a male obsession with Rome, or a childish attempt to catch a glimpse of our own reflection by peering too deeply down into the well of history, as a typologist, I would argue this is exactly what we should be doing. And I would also argue that America, the constitutional republic that we are, has long since had her crossing of the Rubicon moment. If there is a typological connection between the rise of the Roman emperor and the coming of the king of the north, as I believe there is, then I would argue that if the current political conditions between today's Romans and today's Greeks, wink wink, hint hint, ever results in an open civil conflict, the likely result of that will be the rise of Daniel 1140's King of the North. Now there's one more important figure that historically falls in this King of the North line of succession that this video would be incomplete if we did not talk about him, and that is the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, it opens with the iconography of a woman in labor, ready to give birth to a male child, who by the context is clearly a reference to the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. In contrast to the woman in labor, it says, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, of course, we know that primarily the dragon is Satan. However, in a secondary sense, the dragon can also represent Rome, as it was the actions of Herod, the Roman-appointed king of Judea, that is being depicted in the opening scenes of Revelation chapter 12. If you recall, he had all the male children in Bethlehem up to the age of two years old put to death in the hopes of also ending the life of Jesus. Now in Revelation chapter 13, it speaks of the king of the north, i.e. the king of Revelations in time Babylon, as another beast coming up out of the earth who had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And in primary sense, the lamb and the dragon represent Christ and Satan. However, I would argue that in a secondary, more earthly and tangible sense, we're talking about the church and, historically, the Roman state. Now, of course, there is no individual in the history of either Rome or Christendom that is more responsible for uniting the church with the Roman state than was Constantine. In AD 325, Constantine convened and presided over the Council of Nicaea, an event that brought the bishops of the church into not only communion with, but also under the authority of the emperor of Rome. The Christianized Roman Empire that resulted from the conversion of Constantine continued for over 1,100 years until its eventual fall to the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed in AD 
1453. Now we need to understand something important here about the history of Christendom, and that is that the merger of the early church with Rome via the conversion of Constantine, this was not the only church-state merger in history that has resulted in an over 1,100-year reign of a Christian empire. In the mid-8th century, the Bishop of Rome broke off from his political subjugation to the emperor in Constantinople and formed a new alliance with the Franks. In gratitude for having been granted the title Patrician of the Romans by Pope Stephen II, Pippin the Short defeated the Lombards and in 754 gifted the territories won to the papacy. These territories, known as the Papal States, were held by the Pope until 1870 when the city of Rome was captured during the unification process of Italy. Again, for over 1,100 years, Western Christendom existed as the second of two great Christian empires. Again, if you would like to learn more about these two Christian empires and how the two men who founded them are typological of end-time events, I would encourage you to watch my previous video, Christendom, foreshadow of Antichrist. Remember that the word anti and Antichrist can mean one of two things. It can simply mean just against something, as in against Christ, against Christianity, against the church. In this sense, there are many Antichrist forces in the world today, such as Islam, Zionism, secular humanism. The King of the South himself is Antichrist in this sense. However, anti can also mean in place of, as in someone who claims to stand on earth in place of Christ, such as the title of the Vicar of Christ, claimed by the Pope. Vicar means someone who stands in the place of another. Vicar of Christ means someone who stands in the place of Christ, i.e. the Antichrist. Now, in closing, I believe that when the King of the North rises at the time of the end, he will do two things of great significance. One, he will utterly destroy and decimate Egypt, the King of the South. That part I look forward to with great anticipation. And two, when he is fully recognized as the sole emperor of the West, he will unite with the church. However, unlike Constantine, who united in communion with all of the bishops of the church, the final king of the north will need union with but one, the bishop of Rome, i.e. the pope, who when they do unite, this will form a third and final Christian empire. However, this one will only last three and a half years, as God will declare it, i.e. Babylon, fallen. Well, that would do it for this episode of Typology and Prophecy. If you did stick with me to the end, please understand that you are super awesome and that you have my full appreciation. Leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. If you were blessed, please smash that like button and consider supporting me by purchasing one or even both of my books. Links are in the description and pinned comments below. Thank you for joining me today and God bless.